Um, it's great to be here. Uh, so I do a lot of work in free and open source software communities around the community organizing part. I uh, came to this, uh, this place not from a computer science background, but from a political organizing background. So when I first got here, I was like, what do you mean we don't take notes at meetings or all these other things that to my political organizing background were anathema. It's like, how do we get anything done? Why, how do you make sure we don't have the same tedious, awful meeting every week? And then I found out, actually, we just have the same tedious, awful meeting every week sometimes. And then, you know, I, after feeling my way around, I found not everyone was beyond redemption. And so I started giving talks on how we could import some of the things that I know from the uh, political organizing community into free software communities, uh, hopefully to their benefit. So um, some of these things, I, uh, I obviously listened to Jim's talk earlier. It sounds like a lot of these things you may already be doing or you may be doing them some of the time. So this is more to kind of give you a framework of like best practices for all the time. And um, you know, so if, if I've gone over stuff and you're like, I totally already do that. I believe you, it's fine. Uh, you may not do all of the things all of the time yet. So, um, so before I uh, go any further, I want to talk about like what kind of a boss. Like in uh, communities of volunteers, obviously, like boss is a little bit. Uh, you might not call yourself boss ever, really. Uh, but if you've been here for a while, then you end up being a facilitator, maybe, or a leader, or a mentor. So. Um, so for starters, I'm not talking about this kind of a boss, like someone who plays everything close to the chest, strictly need to know, might be dangerous for you. Um, so not that kind of a boss. And not like, as much as I like watching Liz Lemon on TV, she's a little bit of a panicky micromanager. And she forgets to tell people like, oh, I asked you to do that thing. I didn't tell you it was really important and that the show wouldn't happen. I just asked you to do that thing. So I didn't really tie it into anything. So that's also not a great model for a boss. Great for comedy, not great for um, a project lead. Um, for folks who have not watched Fringe, I think Andrew Broyles is a good boss. He gets out of the way, he lets people make mistakes, um, all the things that I think as project leads and uh, mentors we want to be doing. So if you, if you ever find yourself like, what should I do? Maybe you want to ask yourself, am I Liz Lemoning this or am I Agent Broylesing this? So that might help you as you think about things. Um, so uh, delegation is not magic. Uh, it, is, it is great when you do it better, and it does help you a lot with efficiency. Um, but it definitely is also some work. So it's not like abracadabra. Um, and P.S., I love the internet. I just searched for magic carpet, and I got a cat on a carpet, which is great. Um, but uh, so some of the things that we think about in projects as far as being efficient, uh, like reusing code, when you're delegating or you're mentoring, if you can build resources that you can reuse, that's going to help you be more efficient. Um, so instead of, like if you think of, uh, like for conference management, if you say like, well, in 2013 we were in Portland, which has great public transportation, and everyone went across the street to the Starbucks that was around the corner, the person who's helping to organize next year's event, wherever that is, is going to have to start all over again. So you might put something more general that says, find a place that people can get coffee, recommend it, whatever it is. Just, you know, make it a, a reusable resource. Uh, even better, you'll be helping uh, the person who comes after you to delegate this task to delegate. So you might end up being the meta delegator, which is a great place to be, because that means we have more people involved, more people doing things. Uh, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't wait until you're about to burn out to start delegating. Um, I do a lot of work with, uh, well, I don't want to call them out specifically, but the uh, some of the older projects that I've worked with, and they're like, so there's two of us. It's been two of us for like eight years. I hate it. Uh, I never go on vacation. How do I delegate? And I'm like, Oof, you really waited. Like, you kind of waited seven years too long, at least, maybe seven and a half. So, um, so don't wait. Uh, so. One of the things uh, when you're thinking about volunteers, 
you want to know what motivates volunteers. People ask me sometimes, they're like, so when people leave the project, do you know why that is? And they're asking me, like, do I know why people left their project? And I say, well, when you did an exit interview, what did they say? And they're like, a what? So, you know, um, here, this is more general, and we'll get into more techniques for finding out specifically. But uh, we tend to do a really good job of this one, self-actualization, and that's kind of the satisfaction that you get from like accomplishment, uh, making stuff, solving new problems, learning new things. Um, but sometimes we do get stuck where someone's been doing the same thing for a while and we forget to check in as a community like, is this still new for you? Is this still fun for you? Like, are you still getting something out of this? Or do you feel like we hung this title and an albatross around your neck and now you have to do it forever? So don't, don't let people uh, stop you know, being uh, fulfilled in that way. Uh, the esteem one, this is uh, when you're feeling respected by your peers. And, uh, and I'm sure everyone has like a general sense of like, yes, I want everyone on my project to know that I like them and appreciate them. But uh, thanking people is the best free awesome for your project that you can infuse. It's like having a license to print money or bitcoins or something. But thank yous are, are like free money. Um, and then the kind of thank you that you do, like, uh, so one of the things I do besides this is I play in a band, and, and we're really loud. So I have friends who come, and they're like, oh, uh, great set after the show. And what they're saying to me is, I don't hate you. I want you to know that I watched that thing you did. So I said, great set. So when you thank your contributors, and you're like, great job, uh, it could be more verbose. Um, something like, that was a really creative solution to a hard problem. I am so glad that you took that on. Or, wow, you really got that whole mess cleaned up. I can't even imagine how long it took you, but I really appreciate it. It's so much better than great job. The other thing that is also free to add like another, like really thoroughly thank someone is if you thank them in front of someone else or on the mailing list or on the website. So if you introduce like one of your mentees as like, this is Sarah, she's doing some stuff for us. Or this is Sarah, she just triaged all these bugs. It's amazing. Like Sarah's now like, ooh, I feel a little glowy inside, like super appreciated. So it, when you have the opportunity to do that, take it. Um, social, uh, this is, you know, like obviously we have great in-person events. Oh, did you have a question? I wanted to add just a, a short bit here. We, sure. We often do a lot of code review as mm -hmm. MC members that have actually, if you've already invested the time to understand the code, letting people know that you actually really, uh, that you looked at their code and that you were satisfied with it, and then talking about it in detail gives people uh, that feel that one plus the yeah, more detail is always great. Fantastic, thanks. Um, so as we kind of go down the stack, some of this stuff, uh, like I said, social, whenever you can facilitate connections, like if you know that your project, like maybe it's small and there's eight of you and you happen to know like that two people from your project are both gonna be at the same conference but they haven't met yet, you might try suggesting that they meet up. Like, oh, you know, uh, George and Mary, you guys are both going to be at PyCon. You guys should try and get a coffee or something so that you can meet in person. And that just helps people feel more invested in the project. It, you know, it brings the temperature down on IRC if you have that kind of a problem ever. Um, no one has that problem, right? IRC is a lovely place. Okay. Um, and then as you get down to like safety and physiological, this tends to be less important unless you're doing in person. So this is like physical safety. Obviously, if you have someone on your IRC channel that thinks death threats are funny, you're eventually only gonna have that guy in your IRC channel. So, and, and you, which is like, why would you punish yourself in that way? Um, so, you know, keep an eye on stuff like that. And then physiological, like this is some of the things that happen at events, like making sure you have vegan options and handicap ramps and that it's not like everyone must have a car and drive to the venue, that type of stuff. So um, there's plenty on the internet on how to run a conference that's good and this seems to be working very well, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, so building a community where questions are welcome, where you've planned for delegation. Um, 
questions, welcome. Uh, one of the things that works great is that as soon when you have new people, trying to encourage them to start ask, like answering questions as soon as possible, it makes them feel part of the community. It also helps diffuse the burden. So if you're like five years in on your project, your person who's like six months in can definitely or almost always answer questions from someone who's like a week in. And so like you don't have to answer those 101 questions. Uh, the other thing about 101 questions, like if you are like, oh, this, I have to answer that all the time and like such a drain, um, the more uh, kind of resources that you can point people to to help them help themselves, uh, the less of a drain it's going to be on you, the more empowered that person is going to be. Some of those resources are internal, like your wiki, your mailing lists, and your, IC, your IRC channels. But some are external. Um, I happen to be on the board at Open Hatch, so we have training missions that are specifically designed to help people get up to speed on collaborative uh, development models and things like that. So like there's a Git training mission. A lot of times people come out of school, like they've learned like three programming languages, but they've never worked collaboratively. And they don't want their first message on IRC or on the mailing list to be like, I don't understand how to use Git. So you can kind of in the back channel say like, here's this little training mission. It's going to teach you how to use Git. Then you can come back and you'll be good and you'll be at the place where you can start on things that you know how to do. Um, open advice, Stack Overflow, you probably know of the things already that are specific to your project. Um, so as much as, much as possible, like keeping an idea of what those resources are, maybe documenting them on your wiki so that people can help themselves. Um, last on this, uh, doing what you can to prevent turf problems and having like a clear chain of command or maybe not command, but like who's in charge of what parts or who's working on what things. Um, one of the things you may want to consider here is an automatic drop of licked cookies. Do you guys know what I mean by cookie licking? I'm seeing blanks. So. Uh, Selena knows. Um, a licked cookie is when someone says, like, you know, something comes up and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll look into that. By which they mean, I have some vague passing interest and I will never write a line of code on that. They don't know that's what they're saying. I don't want to call them out. But that's that they are thinking, like, well, you know, maybe my 15 hours a week in my spare time could be 16. It usually isn't the case. So um, there's a great project uh, that does an automatic drop of that type of thing, uh, LibreVox, which is actually um, it's people reading uh, older, older public domain works and then putting them under a Creative Commons license. So um, people who have hearing impairments, I'm sorry, with visual impairments can hear the, uh, these things being read. So they have a really nice thing. They're like, you can sign up to read a chapter. Sign up, it's yours for two months, and then life happens, that's totally fine. If you haven't touched it in two months, it automatically goes back in the pool. So for some projects, that'll be more uh, you know, doable than others, depending on the way that you splice up your work. So, uh, so documentation. This is um, not based on scientific data. So uh, this, is, this is just all anecdotal. So, you, when you start on a new task for yourself, you go from how does this work to like, wow, I am awesome at this, right? So this is great. Where do you think the best time to document is? Anyone? Anywhere along the line. You, go ahead and say stop when you think I've got there. Yep. Oh, good. You guys are great. Um, so because this is what happens. Like, yeah, learning. Why can't we automate this? This is the wrong time to document. <laughs> So, uh, totally wrong. So, there's my last um, super awesome graph. Uh, so, yeah, this is the best time to document. You're like, I'm looking at it with a beginner's eyes, and I am like saying all the things. Uh, and then, like, oh, yeah, I'm getting pretty good at this, but I don't really remember how it felt to not know what step one was. So, you don't put step one in. If you do end up having to document here, have someone else look at what you did and make sure that they can replicate your steps. Because everyone misses step one. When I started on free software, like, I got like, I was like, oh, I'll take a look at the Emacs manual. And I'm like, it seems like chapter one is missing. And they're like, no, 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 everyone knows how to do that stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm telling you, chapter one is missing. <laughs> so, um, so, this, again, worst time to document. So. Um, good. I hope we're uh, we're all on the same there. So, 
setting great expectations. I don't mean overselling it. If really it is going to be sleeping outside, then tell people. Um, so great expectations uh, mean like very realistic and thorough expectations. Uh, so there's a couple of different like kind of points on there. Uh, doing your best to be realistic about the time that will be involved, if you can, uh, will give people a sense of like, OK, this is doable. Um, uh, one of the things that I've noticed with uh, new contributors is that they're like, it took me five hours to write like 20 lines of code. I'm like, well, yeah, sometimes it takes a really long time, especially if you're working on something that has a lot of moving parts and interacts with a lot of other things. And this code base is new for you, so yeah, that's OK. Um, but also, like, so they know, like, oh, I shouldn't take on a 50-hour task and then move to Australia the week later because I'm not going to actually have time to finish this thing. Uh, if you can also uh, communicate the complexity of the task, that is also helpful. So if it's, you know, if you're like, oh, we think this will probably have about like seven different moving parts, that also gives people a sense of like, is this something that is a good task for me to take on, or how long will it take me personally to do this? Um, also telling them who else might be involved, like who's going to be doing patch review, things like that, so that they're not, they don't feel like they've done something wrong when they get an email out of the blue from someone else that's involved, like, uh-oh, I screwed up, someone else is checking in, so that they're not surprised, like, oh yeah, Jim is totally going to write you a note about that, like, no worries. So. Um, Talk about what they can do when they get bottlenecked and uh, so they're empowered to do more. So if they hit a bottleneck, let them know like it's, it's not that you took a wrong turn or you are, are doing it wrong. Come to me or go here, look here, ask this person, whatever kind of a thing uh, they need to do to move on. But you, what you don't want is people like sadly thinking like I did it wrong, I'll just wait. Because that's not good. That's like a crummy feeling like, oh, I was moving along at this great clip, and now it's like, yeah, like someone shot my horse, and I'm like stuck in the desert. Um, so uh, another thing you can do here yeah, is to model good, like your ideal delegate behavior for yourself. So um, asking polite questions when you need clarification and having people model that on the mailing list where they're like, oh, hey, I forget. Like, you forgot to tell me what that acronym stands for. Or um, maybe you want to remind the list, like, how come you're not doing it this way or, or something like that. Um, and taking on more when you can without stepping on toes, but also stepping back when you uh, have taken on too many things and showing folks that that's OK. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, if you can let folks who come to your project know that uh, not finishing something and just sort of burying it and sitting on it for weeks and weeks is so not the good way to do it, and that um, handing something off or handing it back is like, yay, we love you, gold stars, all that stuff, um, just make sure that it's kind of like baked in. So. Um, you know, so don't say that and then like have people snarking in IRC like Sally didn't finish that thing and like you know. So make sure it's like oh okay, well it's an opportunity. Someone else can take it on. Um, so the more of an idea that people will have like what's going to happen going in, the the more happy they're going to be as the their task or their uh, mentorship by you goes on. So are people good? We're like. I don't know if uh, if people have other qu if you guys have other questions, feel free to dig in. Okay, so macro versus micro. Um, it's I think everyone here has a mission statement or like an overall goal for their project, right? Maybe okay. Well, all right. In your mind, if you can say what it is, uh, and it should be on your website anyway, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but uh, sometimes people are doing like a little micro task, and um, they start to feel like they've been given the take out the garbage task all the time. Um, so if you can try and tie the micro task to the macro goal and let them know like how it works its way up to the macro goal. Uh, that is very empowering for people. Uh, there's a couple of things that happen there, like 
you might want to sort of think of your uh, tasks that you have within your project as a pyramid. So you have your goal at the top, and then you have like uh, maybe like various broad strategies, like we're going to build a client side and a server side thing of whatever it is you're trying to do. And then you have specific tactics or parts that make up each of your strategies, like so plugins or user interface or you know smaller bits. And then the uh, you know you get kind of to the things there are a lot of like bugs and triage and documentation. And so making sure that people understand that those things all kind of feed into the goal. Uh, is great. Um, and also making sure that folks understand that the smaller tasks lead into the bigger tasks. Like nobody starts in at the top like writing a mission statement and then expecting people to fill in. They, they did all of the little bits along the way. Um, you know, so you can, uh, one way to kind of really drive this home is if you, you know, have someone like, wow, this is like three months on this bug triage, and just let them know, like, you know, Jim started here too, so you're going to be good, or whatever it is. It's um, just making sure that people know the micro in aggregate really makes the macro happen so that they feel important, right? Okay. So um, let's talk about it. So, how are we on time? Oh, we're okay. All right. So, we talked about what motivates people in a general sense, uh, but it's very important to know what motivates your individual people in a specific sense. Um, and the best way to find that out is to ask them. It's, it's, sometimes that's revolutionary, but it is really the best way to find that out. Um, one of the things that I really like from the world of uh, organizing is doing what's called a one-on-one. -on -one. So after someone's done like their first little bit of work or their first piece of something, um, you kind of find out like, hey, how did that go? How did you feel about that? Um, how does this fit in with your goals? Like you're a CS student or like you've been working on another project before or oh, you're trying to build up your resume because you're between gigs. All of those things will help you um, get them into other tasks that will help them with their personal goals. So the more you can align like work for your project with their personal goals, the more work they're going to want to do for you. So that, right, that makes sense to everybody. Um, you can also, this is also when you find out like, oh, that thing was really frustrating. Um, and then you can do something about it. Like maybe your, um, maybe your bite-sized bugs or your first contributor tasks are too big. Um, and that happens a lot. Because for you, if you've been there for years, like, it's like, oh, that would take me 10 minutes. Sometimes the place to start is to delegate something that feels like it's too small to delegate, which feels like it's taking your time. But I would think of that as, um, have you ever done like a technical interview where they ask you to solve a little problem at the end? Or they ask, like for my work, like I get asked to submit like a writing sample and that type of thing. So um, think of like a, a bite-sized bug or a task that is too small to delegate as uh, fulfilling that sort of function, but for your unpaid contributors. So, oh yeah. I sometimes think those kind of bugs, you know, I mean what you're teaching someone when they fix it is the process. Right. But, you know, Exactly, and and that's uh, yeah. It can't it can't be underestimated. Like the just finding out if someone can do a good job and a conscientious job. Like it might not work, but if they followed all the rules, like oh, I did the headers the way you told me, and I did the bug process the way you told me, I submitted it to the person that you told me to, all of those kinds of things. That lets you know, like okay, I can work with this person. They're worth spending my time on. So. Um, another thing you may find out that the tasks that in your mind go together aren't the tasks that actually go together. So a lot of like more mature projects have like that one person like, you know, like Bob or Julie and they do like all the things or they do like some swath of things that because they've been doing them together for so long seem like they go together. But it's when you're looking for new contributors and uh, new folks for your project, you're not looking for like another Julie because that's, well, it's kind of weird. But it, uh, it's, you're, you're looking for someone who can take on some of the things that Julie was doing. So you usually will have to pull them apart 
and and that is totally okay. It's um, you know, what if it, you know, instead of Julie, you now have like six new contributors that are on their way to taking on lots of things. So that's, that's an opportunity. It's not a like, man, I sure wish we could just find another Julie. So um, with these conversations, um, you may find out that uh, your project doesn't value the work that you actually need done. And there's a couple of fixes for that. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples of this is the Twisted Project. So they had this thing where um, they had been incentivizing lines of code, like rock star style. Like, so they had like a video game kind of, you know, like top scorers, but it was like lines of code. And, you know, and they were like, yeah, it's super cool. So the more lines of code you produce, like the higher up the thing you go. And then they sort of looked at like what their project needed. They were getting all these patches, and no one was reviewing new people's patches. So what they did was they assigned like a giant bonus on the scoreboard for patch review. And all of a sudden, everyone's like taking patches for review just as soon as they arrive. Like, no, I got that one. I got that one. And so like they see, you know, the person at the top is like spending more time reviewing patches than writing code. But now they have more contributors. So they incentivize the behavior that they really wanted to see. Um, you know, and so like on that vein, like, um, when you think about like how many people are contributing to your project, uh, when you thank them, like in blog posts and things like that, uh, remember to always thank like your translators and your documenters and like you know even like I um, I work on Media Goblin and I had a friend sit down and have like a two hour lunch with me to talk about like user experience stuff and like how we should start to approach that. She's on the blog post for that release because I was like. You know, I mean, I didn't buy her a very fancy lunch, so that, that counts as contribution to me. So um, incentivize the kind of behavior that you want to see, and that is super, super important. Um, so let's see. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, what happens when you, you know, kind of all goes pear-shaped and you have a troublesome contributor. Like, maybe, like, there is no boss, but everything gets facilitated through you, or you're, like, the project mediator. What do you, what do you guys do when that happens? You have someone troublesome. Does anyone want to tell me what they've done or tried? No? It didn't go that well? You don't want to share? <laughs> All right. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do. You can try and like get that person to work on something different, find a better fit for them. Um, but sometimes it is not you, it is actually them. So we're going to go to the live delegating part. This is, uh, I'm going to make you guys help me on this. How big is that? OK. All right. All right. So this is where you're going to give me pieces. Um, can you guys read that? Or I don't know how to make that bigger, actually. Um, but I will read it out after we do it. So I need you guys to give me an IRC, Nick. Have you played Mad Libs before? If you haven't, you're going to see it worse in a minute. This is a very short one. No one? Huh? C U R C U R U. Okay. Uh, and the superlative, that's an adjective that's like got an E S T on the end of it. Come on. Snazziest. Snazziest. Okay. All right. And then a type of web service. Anything. Is this like the low blood sugar part of the day? <laughs> XML, XML, RPC, like that maybe? Uh, and then a profession? Wow. Lawyer. Plumbers, all right. <laughs> uh, I need a number? 42, oh, that's a good choice. And then a plural body part. Fingers. All right. And one more, a bad project behavior. Bulldozing. Bulldozing. Do you want to tell us what bulldozing is? Uh, responding too frequently in a short span of time to a threat. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, everyone knows what that responding in a frequent uh, frequently in a short span of time to a threat. And then uh, a negative emotion. Rage. Rage. All right. All right. Uh, hi, Kirkuru. I hope you can help me with something. As you know, we're trying to build the snazziest XML RPC for plumbers that the world has ever seen. And we're planning to localize it for 42 new countries this month. Everyone is working their fingers to the bone around here. So when you engage in bulldozing, it may see other com contributors feel rage. And that hurts the whole project. What do you think we should do about that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it's GPLv3, sorry, I couldn't find an Apache version. <laughs> so, um, okay, and then, yes, all right. Um, so, uh, that was pretty goofy, but I, I hope it helps you remember that the best course when you have like a problem contributor is to, um, is to address it head on. There, uh, people do kind of know when there's like whisperings and weirdnesses like, oh yeah, well, we're gonna have like a super awesome pizza party. Oh, we didn't, we forgot to invite you. So they know that something is wrong when they're like kind of going against the grain. So go ahead and address them directly. Um, and then, you know, don't be the cigarette man where you're like shadowly moving things around in the background. Uh, honesty is always the best policy. So um, let's see, those are all my picture credits. And then if people have questions, uh, this is the moon. Uh, we shoot for the moon, dial it like a boss. Thanks very much. <laughs> all right, so questions on any of that or delegating or maybe the moon? Selena. Mm -hmm. how, to, how to kind of encourage them to do something a little more productive. It, I've been in that situation a couple different times in, with uh, pilotings, mm -hmm. having very helpful people that want to like share knowledge and contribute, but um, maybe not doing it in the most helpful way. Mm -hmm. And the most effective thing that I've found is to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and describe exactly what it is that I would like them to do, mm -hmm. and then Right, yeah, so the one-on-one -on -one is a great technique for finding out that you actually aren't a good fit. Like if someone says, um, you know, my goal is to, whatever, snazzy up your website, and you're like, oh, we really already have a web person, or uh, like our website is so tiny, or, you know, something like that. Like either the role is taken, or they want to do something that you don't need done. Like... <laughs> So, uh, you know, like, oh, I, uh, I thought I would join this anarchist group of coders, and then I think we should do a government edition of our code. And it's like, I don't think you're in the right place. So uh, if you have that conversation, then you can find out, like, oh, you should find a government project and go work on that. So um, not every contributor is right for every project. And the sooner you find that out and, and do it in a nice way before it gets all sour and weird uh, with goodwill, like maybe they'll run into other anarchists later in life or they'll come back around after their government project experience. Like if you leave them with the warm fuzzy, like, you know, this isn't the best place, but good luck. That's way better than like, those people just kicked me off the mailing list, and I don't know why. <laughs> so, other questions? Yeah. I was going to say one, one thing I don't know if you talk about is the poisonous people video. Yeah. By Fitz and and uh, That's a good. The poisonous people video and uh, Donnie Burkholz says a uh, talk on uh, how assholes are killing your project. And he recommends a few books in there that kind of, like the numbers bear that out. Like it's what happens when you have like one person 
uh, on your mailing list or in IRC that is super poisonous, um, other people see that if you don't respond to it and they're like, oh, I've been looking for a place to be a jerk. Sounds like this place is for me. So eventually they outnumber all of your other people and then you're like, oh man, I have to hang out with jerks all day. And so you got to nip it in the bud while you've got one and be like, hey, maybe you're not aware that you're coming off like a jerk, but if you are aware and you're doing it anyway, then you've got to go somewhere else because we're not into that. In the back. I would try it privately first, especially given um, when you have a worldwide project and the language barrier may be an issue or like just like maybe they didn't check and see like kind of what the code of conduct for your community is. So like, you know, you always assume ignorance like, oh, maybe you thought that was funny or maybe you didn't know that we're not down with that here. Um, and so like I always try that first. So other questions, comments? Sure. Um, how do you know whether you're the person who's supposed to be doing the delegating, or do you ever find that it's not clear who it is supposed to be delegating to whom? Right. So how do you know if you're the person who's supposed to be doing the delegating? Um, so this is more of like a mentorship model. So like I think like if someone comes into your channel and is like, I need someone who can help me figure out what's going on with this library. And then it's like crickets, 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 and you go in and you're like, I know about that library. Then you're the person. In the duocracy, you've just um, elected yourself. So um, other times, like, you know, maybe, uh, like, if you do have one of those poisonous contributors, uh, maybe you don't want to, you know, take it on right away, but you might want to check in the back channel and say, like, hey, uh, George, do you know what's going on with contributor X? Like, uh, has anyone spoken to him or her about this kind of behavior? And then, like, make sure, then instead of having them get pig piled by, like, three people, like, you're being a jerk, you can have a conversation with a couple folks and then be like, hey, so, you know, I'm going to send you a note, like, you're being a jerk. So, if you're not sure, you can always ask and be like, does someone else? People don't generally like confrontation. So if you're like, can I, can I take on the confrontation? Like most of the time people will be like, oh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, yeah, one more in the back. Just a quick comment on, on the, the, the jerk behavior handling. Yeah. Um, and A, I think um, it's important to know when to be a jerk and when to be a jerk. Right. Right, so people don't want to be jerks, and then also making sure that you're criticizing the behavior and not the person. Um, and that's extremely important. Um, it's uh, Nothing gets something, someone more inflamed than saying you're uh, whatever it is, uh, but to say like that behavior was jerky. Yeah, or whatever appropriate adjective for whatever the behavior is. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and then it's lunch. Anyone? Are we, okay, everyone's good. They're ready to go forth and delegate like a boss. Fantastic. Thanks so much.